Hey there everybody, welcome back to another episode of What is a Video Series where I get first looks and reviews on video games that I have played recently. I try to keep these videos as spoiler free as possible, but stuff happens. Do that timestamps are in the description down below and hopefully chapters pop up so you are free to skip to whichever sections you're most curious about. This episode, we're going to discuss what is Alone in the Dark. Alone in the Dark is a reboot of the classic horror franchise that first came onto the scene back in the 90s. The original is believed to be the launching point of the survival horror genre. Just to be upfront and transparent though, I've never played any of those earlier entries. And I'm not much of a horror game person in general, I'm a bit of a wimp. So I will not and honestly cannot speak to how well this title holds up compared to its originals. Alone in the Dark, a third person psychological horror game, takes place in a secluded, 1920s Louisiana estate called Dorsetto Manor. Dorsetto works as a bit of a mental asylum, housing a wide array of guests with varying degrees of issues that they are all working through. After receiving a troubling letter from her uncle Jeremy, Emily Hartwood hires private investigator Edward Carnby to join her on a trip to Dorsetto Manor. Emily is hoping to check in with her uncle and make sure everything is alright with him. No real clue why she needed a PI with her to talk with her uncle, but she does make mention that waving his gun around may get them what they need when it comes to the staff. At this point, the players are able to choose whether or not they want to play as Emily or Edward. Once the decision is made, you're locked into that character. There's no switching back and forth between the two like you may see in other games with the genre. The story of Alone in the Dark is generally the same no matter who you play through it as, the only difference being a flashback section where each character confronts a moment from their past that they are maybe trying to forget. The pair quickly learns that Jeremy has gone missing and take it upon themselves to investigate his disappearance. Their investigation takes them on a journey through the Sodom Manor, the human psyche, ancient cults, and these weird dream spaces, all as they try to track down exactly where Jeremy went. I found the story itself enjoyable overall, even though it felt a bit rushed towards the end. I took my time taking in its narrative, looking for as many clues as possible to get the full backstory, and it still felt like the ending was abrupt. It definitely could have used another chapter to flesh out or one or two more things and connect the final dots before the story's final moments. The voice acting performance in this game is pretty great from almost all parties. However, I do feel like the side characters outshine the main characters in the grand scheme. Emily and Edward are acted out by Jodie Comer and David Harbour, both with fantastic resumes and have proven to be fantastic performers. Sadly, throughout the game, it felt as if Comer was uninterested in her role and the utilization of Harbour's charm was kept to a minimum. Bringing in Hollywood talent to act out these iconic characters was a big part of the game's promotion, and I just expected them to steal the show. Sadly, that turned out to not be the case. What are you doing, child? You shouldn't be alone. Go find my coffee. Who are you? Are you here for the Fay Dodo? Go upstairs now. Grr. My name is Emily Hartwood. I, I'm, I'm the niece of Jeremy Hartwood. This is Detective Carnby. The police? Why are you here? No, I'm a private investigator. Sorry to bother you. My client's worried about her uncle. He's a patient here at Tercetto. If you don't mind, could you direct us where to find him? I quite enjoyed my time exploring the setting in Alone in the Dark. From the eerie hallways of Tercetto Manor to the French Quarter of New Orleans, every setting was well detailed and captured the atmosphere perfectly. The game gets a map of the manor into players' hands very early on, so at no point did I ever get lost. The map even goes as far as showing you what doors can be unlocked as you gather the various keys in the game. I greatly appreciated this because as I grow in age, it becomes tougher to remember small little details like this with all the games that I play. Gathering the different clues and collectibles felt rewarding for players like me who enjoy uncovering every bit of a game's backstory. A welcome touch this game had was all the text for the clues can actually be read out by the character who wrote it. I honestly can't even remember a game I've played that has this feature, but I loved it. Especially coming from the Thaumaturge where that game is roughly 80% reading. The collectibles, called lanyaps, come in sets of three, and upon completing these sets, players are rewarded with access to more lore to digest. To complete most of these sets will require a second playthrough with the opposite character you did your first playthrough with. Multiple playthroughs are actually recommended because there are apparently five different endings available, two for each character, and then a true ending that can be obtained by either one. 
I have no clue how to obtain any of the fancy endings, but I can only assume it has something to do with collecting the different lanyaps if I had to make a guess. Let's go ahead and quickly get this out of the way. The combat is a steaming hot pile of garbage. Enemy variety is non-existent, melee attacks are clunky, and depending on the difficulty you play, the enemies soak your gun's bullets like a sponge soaks up water. The only saving grace is that it never felt like the combat was overly forced down my throat, and it spread those sections out enough that I never grew overly annoyed by its clunkiness. That and the oomph that was behind every shot of the guns brought a smile to my face every time they blessed my ears. On the opposite side of the coin, the puzzle solving in this game was immensely rewarding. Embedding solutions to the puzzles and the clues picked up while exploring and within the environment itself. While none of them felt overly difficult, piecing together information from various clues to come up with a solution just felt good. There's no inventory to manage, just the bullets in your guns and the game automatically caps you out on how many bullets you can hold for each one. While inventory management is a staple in the survival horror genre, I welcomed not having the added stress considering I don't play these types of games too often. Veterans of the genre though may see it as a missed opportunity. Alone in the Dark is by no means a bad looking game. From the character models to objects in the environment, everything felt to be highly detailed and cared for. However, being on Unreal Engine 4, people may see the graphics as a bit dated due to the influx of games we are seeing from Unreal Engine 5. Sadly, there were still heavy moments of stuttering that would pop up throughout the game most notably when traveling through a doorway into a new area. You could tell the game was clearly loading that area in, instead of it being a seamless process like the developers intended. While it is an unacceptable issue for an engine that is a generation old, the traversal stuttering was the only issue I ran into, and for those who do struggle with frame rate, the game does offer a variety of options to tweak until you reach the numbers you desire. Sound design is key to setting the atmosphere of a horror game. Alone in the Dark does a great job of using its soundtrack and sounds in the environment to keep players on their toes. From the creaking and slamming of doors behind you as you enter a new area, to shuffling and shouting from rooms above you and beside you, it all put me in a state of unease while moving throughout the game. At Alone in the Dark's $60 price tag, I just don't find it worth it for anybody at this moment in time. I'm not a big proponent of time spent to money spent ratios, but waiting for a sale will probably be your best bet if you have any interest in this game. It's a short commitment that takes less than 12 hours to complete with both characters, and I can imagine less than 20 to 100% it. And honestly, the shorter game was refreshing on the palette with this influx and this world of open world games that we live in. but. It's just not a, a complete game. It's a game that seems to have all the pieces there for a great game, but with misconnections and flops and some of the mechanics, it's at best an okay game. I will say though, if you haven't played many horror games and want to dive into them, Alone in the Dark would be a solid first entry. With a lack of inventory management and not overly complicated puzzles, it's a fine jumping off point into the genre. Thank you all so much for watching the video today. Please consider subscribing to the channel, hit the like button, and let me know what is the scariest game you've played in the comment section down below. After playing this, I feel like I want to dive into more, but I want to I wanna see what the scary ones are. Just really rip that bandaid off and, and throw me into the fire, I think is where we need to go next. Doing those three simple things though helps the video out reach a ton of new people, like an insane amount of new people. And by doing that, it affords me more opportunities to review more games in the future and have them out maybe on release day and not a week after the game releases. I'll see you guys in the next one.